Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. This episode, The Mosman Granny Killer, written by Chris. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, <laughs> it's 9 o'clock in the morning and we're starting the day with a man who kills grannies. Love that, get have a good one. I feel better now. It's not gonna, that's not going to bring down the rest of my day at all, is it? I always feel bad when I say that because I'm like, oh no, it brings me down. It's like, yes, yeah, Simon, oh great, so your day was ruined. Someone was murdered. Possibly many people. How do you feel now? Well, I feel even worse, don't I? Nobody likes to cry, baby. Am I having a conversation with myself? Let's just jump into it. The format of the show, I've never read this before. Chris has written it for me. We're going to explore it together. I mean, you and me, Chris has already explored it in depth. So let's just jump in. Mosman sits atop a hill overlooking the water in the middle harbour part of Sydney's most famous waterway. Home to Taronga Zoo and Balmoral Beach, its inhabitants are among the richest in the country. There's a small cluster of shops, a long strip of expensive boutiques, and widely spaced groups of spacious English style cottages and medium rise luxury apartment buildings. This idyllic insularity was even more marked back in the 90s, when much of our story takes place. Detective Inspector Mike Hagan recalled that crime was practically non-existent in Mosman at the time. Yeah, it's because it's filled with great people. Great people because they have money. Because <laughs> that's how we judge greatness and morals and righteousness. That's sarcasm. <laughs> Just in case it wasn't obvious. You never know what can be taken out of context these days. It was a rude shock then, when elderly ladies began dying violent deaths in the streets and retirement homes of Sydney's most affluent areas. Not just Mosman, but all of Australia at the time thought of serial killings and drive-by shootings as things which happened exclusively in America and not in the quiet and sheltered great southern land. The sheer unexpectedness of finding such evil stalking one of Sydney's safest beauty spots meant that the case of the Mosman Granny Killer, as the press would quickly dub him, gripped the entire nation, putting both the police and media through their paces as they grappled with an entirely new phenomenon and casting a dark shadow of fear and horror over Australians everywhere. I wonder about the statistics there. Like, I also feel the same way. Like, yeah, no, like serial killers, mass shootings and stuff, that's more of an American thing. Isn't it? What happened to the American dream? I mean, terrorism I don't think of as like, you know, terrorist attacks and stuff. I think that's more like an international thing. Whereas I think like shootings, especially like school shootings, that's more of an American vibe, right? I know there was, um, oh God, what was that one? Was it in Ireland? Dunblane? I think it's embarrassing if that's not in Ireland, isn't it? But there was the Dunblane school shooting or some such. That was that one was when I was a kid, I think. But you, the, the big ones you think of are American, right? Virginia Tech, Columbine, um, Sandy Hook. But I think maybe, I don't know what the statistics show. Thinking the unthinkable. In the late afternoon of Friday, the 1st of March, 1989, 82-year-old Gwendolyn Mitchell Hill walked out. That is an old person name and a half, isn't it? Gwendolyn Mitchell Hill. Oh, God, I'm making fun of the person who's going to be killed. I'm sorry, Gwendolyn. And I'm not making fun. I'm just saying you have an old person's name, and that's because you're old. That's fine. I want to die. One day, I'm going to have an old person's name. People are going to be like, Simon, how old are you? 90. I'll be like, yes. <laughs> Yes, I have. I said, have I told the story that the name my neighbor in my old apartment where I used to live was called Adolf? And he was really old. Not because, yeah, I mean, he looked really old. And he was clearly really old. But also, he was born before Hitler came to power. <laughs> so, Gwendolyn's walking past the Mosman RSL. And she made her way to her apartment building just a couple of, what's an RSL? This is, that's an Australian thing. <laughs> it sounds like residential streets for living. <laughs> and made her way to an apartment building just a couple of bucks up the street. For those of you who don't know, the RSL is the Return Services League. Okay, so not residential streets for living. It was a good guess though, fact boy. Well done. Thank you, Simon. An organization initially set up for and by veterans, similar to the VFW in America. <laughs> I don't know what VFW stands for either. It's got to be Veterans for wars no that's not gonna be right is it veterans from wars that could be that could work the mossman rsl was and is something of a community hub offering good quality meals at reasonable for mossman prices and a range of regular social events as well as serving the basic functions of a pub mrs mitchell hill had been shopping just down the street and she had to walk past the rsl to get home a little while later mrs mitchell hill was found sprawled and bleeding at the front entrance of her apartment block by a couple of school kids who'd been visiting relatives in the same building police and an ambulance were called 
as was normal, and given her age and location, and the fact that it was broad daylight, the overriding opinion was that the poor lady had suffered a nasty fall. It was on this assumption that kindly neighbors cleaned Mrs. Mitchell Hill's blood from the scene, thoroughly washing down the front steps and cleaning the splatter from the doors. Yeah, I, I can imagine that this is something I'd do. Like, I get out of the hose and be like, oh god, that poor old lady. I don't want to wait for the street cleaners to come and clean this up, and I'd spray it down, and then the police would be coming by and be like, You have completely contaminated the crime scene. Uh oh. Have I made a mistake? And they'd be like, Did you wash down that blood? <laughs> and be like, Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was just trying to be a good citizen. Mrs. Mitchell Hill was taken to hospital where she died later that night. It was discovered that she was missing her purse, which was known to have contained a reasonable amount of cash, which made police suspicious. Forensic pathologist Dr. Johan de Flew also had serious concerns. Mrs. Mitchell Hill's pantyhose and underwear were missing. It was pretty unusual for a lady, especially one of that age, to go about bare-legged back in those days to say nothing of the underwear. In addition, the injuries to the skull were very severe. We're well intentioned people who'd cleaned up the scene and obscured the volume and distribution of blood loss, so it was only on later examination that it became apparent that Mrs. Mitchell Hill had been severely beaten about the head. There was too much trauma for a simple fall. And on top of this, there was a fracture in the midline of the back of the skull. This is seriously atypical for a backwards fall, as an automatic reaction to falling backwards is to turn the head, meaning that you'd expect to find damage on either of the parietals rather than dead center. All these facts put together led police to the appalling conclusion that this respectable elderly lady had been beaten to death for a purse and presumably some sort of dark sexual motive, despite there being no evidence of rape. Yeah, it's weird. This is already weird. It's like, why is that? Yeah, no comments. Let's just move on. Detective Sergeant Dennis O'Toole was one of the first to visit the crime scene. The missing underwear, coupled with the lack of any evidence for rape or sexual assault, was, in his words, a little bit baffling for the investigators initially. On top of this, there were no witnesses, despite a thorough canvas of the area, no forensic evidence of any value owing to the kindly neighbors who'd cleaned up the scene, and no real indication of motive. Sure, the lady had been robbed, but robbery didn't explain the rest of it, the intense violence of the attack and the weird sexual element. The lack of witnesses also puzzled the police as the attack took place at a busy time of day, less than a minute's walk from the main shopping and restaurant strip and next to a busy construction site. Yeah, not to mention, it, did we say that in the middle of the day? Yeah, busy time of day. But it's daylight! For this sort of crime, I always feel like, can you imagine just walking along the street in the day and getting mugged? But I've never been mugged. Um, but like, you know, I'm aware at night it's more likely that you're going to get mugged. But in the day? Middle of the day? Busy street? You're asking for trouble. Later murders would have a similar lack of witnesses, and this is an important detail to remember for later. Now, Mosman detectives don't get much in the way of murder, this not being Baltimore or Manly, and as we've already seen, they didn't get much in the way of crime in general, at least not violent crime. But this didn't mean they were incompetent, far from it, in fact. The police opened an investigation and worked at it diligently and well. This might have been because wealthy areas get better service. It might also have been that they didn't have much else Else going on, but these two hypotheses are deeply unfair. Mosman and the surrounding area may have been quiet, but Sydney was in the grip of an opioid pandemic at the time, as well as struggling with organized crime, abetted in part by the corrupt coppers down in my old neck of the woods just 20 minutes away. As friends of mine in the police say, being a homicide detective is more of a test of character than of brilliance. There's not much scope for soaring flights of brooding genius or sudden flashes of divine inspiration. It's all about choosing to follow up any and every lead no matter how much you might want to let something slide that's interesting because fiction tells us it's sherlock holmes right it's the genius moments he's sitting there and he's like elementary my dear watson which i believe he never said i think that's a that's a legend i don't think sherlock holmes ever said that in any of the uh the original canon books also why is it that i think it's got to do with property taxes right like if you live in a nice house then your property taxes are going to be higher and do those pay for like local police and stuff so like if you live in a nice area the local police are gonna get more money and so your area is gonna have more police which doesn't make sense they should like flip that around <laughs> so like the areas with less money get more does that make sense does that make sense i mean why is there more crime in poorer areas i feel like if you were in a poorer area wouldn't you go to like beverly hills or mosman or whatever to do your crimes maybe that's why they do need better police i don't know it just seems a bit when you when you're like why do the rich people get better police that feels like something that should be equal <laughs> like healthcare <laughs> controversially a lot of americans listening i realize but you know healthcare should be equal access in my opinion um 
Should it? Oh, I don't know. Look, let's just stop trying to solve the moral quandaries of modern society and let's move on with our script. Every lead, every tip, every possibility needs to be doggedly chased down. This tenacity of purpose is the most valuable asset in a homicide investigator, not only in terms of solving cases, but also in ensuring the strongest possible prosecution. And in a refreshing departure from many cash crime cases, it seems the police on this one consistently passed that test of character. Diligence only goes so far, though, and they had practically nothing to go on. And despite their best efforts, they weren't too hopeful of being able to solve what they had concluded was an isolated, random stranger murder, one of the toughest kind of crimes to solve even under the best of circumstances. The killer, apparently forensically aware, had left no fingerprints or other forensic evidence. There were no witnesses to any sort of suspicious behavior and very little in the way of similar crimes in the area, at least as far as the cops knew at the time. The investigation faltered for want of leads. This was the state of play when, just a month later, on the 9th of May, Lady Winfreda Ashton left the Mosman RSL, having had a pleasant afternoon of lunch and bingo, to return to her home just a few minutes' walk away. Lady Ashton was the 84-year-old widow of Sir John Williams Ashton, one of Australia's most important landscape painters. I was wondering, like, Lady's not her name, right? It's Lady is like, um, the wife of a knight becomes lady. So if you get knighted and made a sir, your wife becomes lady. Does it? It must work the other way around, right? Is that right? Is that still the case? Maybe it's not still the case, because then you're sir and lady. Maybe they don't automatically award it. And it used to be, like, if you had a knighted, then it would pass down to your kid. It's like your son or whatever, which was a bit weird, because it's like, aren't knighted are supposed to be like, when you've done something great, they will award it to you. Like, it's not hereditary. It's like the part of the whole thing I like. Like, I like th that we have this system of awarding people and people like it's prestigious. Whereas, like, House of Lords, Lords and Barons and Dukes and all of this stuff, it's just bullshit passed down from your great great grandpappy that you did nothing to earn. But I am a princess. Or I was. She went back to her apartment block, not far from Mrs. Mitchell Hills, and finding some junk mail in a letterbox, went to the garbage room to get rid of it. Here, she was brutally attacked, the killer smashing her head against the concrete floor repeatedly. It was later discovered that Lady Ashton had fought, it had in fact resisted furiously and very nearly successfully before being overpowered. Her stockings were removed and used to strangle her so violently that traces of the fabric were embedded in her neck. When police found her, what remained of her stockings were folded neatly near her head. Her walking stick and shoes were placed equally neatly by her feet. Her bright red coat and other clothing was disarranged in a way which suggested sexual display, though there was once again no sign of sexual assault. First responders actually drove past the killer who was spending the $100 that he'd stolen from her at the Mossman RSL and commented to staff that he hoped the sirens weren't another robbery that turned violence. Once again, well-meaning residents who'd found her had washed down the crime scene. I don't know how they thought this, but it seems that they too assumed Lady Ashton had suffered a fall. Friends of the victim indicated to police that a bright red purse matching her coat was missing from the scene. Once again, there were no fingerprints, there were no witnesses, and Dr. DeFlo and his team oh, were still nowhere with a murder weapon. Blunt object was just the best they could do. Lady Ashton's red purse was found dumped in Ashton Park, coincidentally named after her late husband, but a search of the park yielded nothing relevant. This time, the police didn't settle for a normal canvassing area, but instead began a massive door-knocking campaign covering four square kilometers and over 2,000 households, basically the whole of the Mossman precinct. This yielded hundreds of leads and also led to the identification of a suspect, a young man who'd been spotted by concerned residents. He was very well described and an identikit was circulated. Basically, Mossman's residents had, when they asked if they'd seen anyone suspicious in the area, put the finger on a young drug addict that they'd seen wandering around their pristine neighborhood. Okay, fair. I mean, it's like, they're asking, like, is there anyone suspicious? And they're saying, yeah, this is a suspicious dude. They're obviously going to need to be able to tie him to a crime. Uh, but seeing as the police have literally nothing else to go on, I don't think this is a, I mean, it's a bad lead but at least it's a lead. Dr. Rod Milton, Sydney's most experienced forensic psychologist, was called in to create a profile. He concluded, contrary to the wandering junkie theory, that the perpetrator was most likely employed and local to at least familiar with the area. Owing to the level of violence, as well as the apparent sexual element, he concluded that the murderer must be reasonably young, as indicated by the statistics on crimes of extreme violence. The killer would likely have had extremely difficult relationships with significant women in his life, and would most likely have some prior to do with violence against women. He also suggested that the killer may have spent some time in the military, as even discounting the washing down of the scenes, there seemed to be a reflexive neatness to them which suggested military training. This profile just seems to be like <laughs> very standard killer profile. 
he didn't have a great relationship with his mother um he had a record of violence against women shocking revelations there the military thing's interesting so that's good but the rest of it is very generic police combined this profile with their own thinking on the fact that both murders had been committed at around the same time of day around 4 p.m and came up with a couple of theories they combed through the records of the hmas penguin a naval base in mosman and started interviewing suspects from the army and navy they also looked at the local schools theorizing that the theft the time of day and the bizarre sexual elements might be explained away by the perpetrator being a school student wait why was the theft and sexual element be like oh yeah no 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 naturally uh sexual murderers most likely to be in school does that make sense what am i missing they came up with hundreds of suspects and followed every one of them up even placing some of them under surveillance but all to no avail the press was convinced straight away with the kind of certainty peculiar to tabloid journalism and tv news that the murders were linked and the police weren't too far behind inspector mike hagan told a documentary team that quote a decision was made to link the two murders which was a very appropriate decision to make the police were under an enormous amount of pressure owing to the bizarre nature of the crimes the equally bizarre fact of their occurring in mosman of all places and justifiable public outrage at these attacks on some of the most vulnerable people in society I'm proud to point out that, as far as I can tell, Lady Ashton's high profile was pretty incidental to the public's interest. People were just as incensed about Mrs. Mitchell Hill as they were about Lady Ashton. Anyway, under all this pressure, Inspector Hagen recalls that he frequently went for long walks around the crime scenes, to quote, trying to get into the minds of who might be doing this. The mayor of Mosman, Justice Barry O'Keefe, responded to public fear by mobilizing the rangers, basically parking police, to stop and speak with any elderly ladies that they might see. They were instructed to talk to them, calm their fears, and offer them a ride home. It seems that the fine ladies of Mosman were, at this stage, alert but not alarmed, and generally refused these services. What they did do, however, was attend public talks on enhanced personal safety. You know the kind, vary your routines, lock your doors, don't talk to strangers, and so on. I've delivered a few of these, and it's amazing to me how rapt people are to receive what I feel is to be basic and highly obvious information, but I guess most people aren't used to living as if they're being hunted, and as for the residents of Mosman, they were now compelled to grapple with the previously unthinkable notion that a serial killer was stalking their streets. Is it a serial killer after two? I thought it's like three or four before you get the rank of serial. Rank? <laughs> What's wrong with you, Simon? Before you get the uh, distinction of serial killer. Again, what's wrong with me? Um, changing your routine seems like a routine seems like an odd one though, doesn't it? It's like I feel like that's some spy shit. I have the routine. Like I go, I start. There's two ways I go to work depending on the day. One, uh, when I drop my kid off at school, they don't go to school on Wednesdays, so on that day I take a different route to work. I don't change my routine because I don't think I'm being hunted. <laughs> I feel like if I was thinking about personal safety, I'd be like, I don't know, carry a pepper spray or a taser or something. <laughs> or a gun! A bazooka. Not like change the way you walk to work. I don't think anyone's like, there's no one who's thinking about mugging me and is like scoping me out and seeing like where I, uh, my journeys and stuff. Like where can I be mugged? And honestly, it's all just busy streets. So not in, in day. So not really many options an eyewitness and a change of scenery wednesday october the 18th just after four o'clock saw 86 year old widow doris cox heading back to her place in a retirement village called the garrison the garrison is on a busy main road i've passed the place thousands of times over the years and is home to a large population of well-to-do retirees requiring varying levels of care as well as independent living apartments the garrison was mostly famous for its immense expense and the occasional violent feud between residents i'm not suggesting mrs cox was part of this rambunctious behavior however we'll soon see that she couldn't have been i just mention it as something locals liked to gossip about oh my god old people homes like where they care for you and stuff like my granddad um who passed away this year he was in one of these towards the end of his life oh my lord it's like an expensive hotel not like crazy expect it was it was hundreds of pounds a day and it's just like jesus christ and i mean i get it because it's like you've got nurses and it's private and stuff and the alternative is what just being at home and having a family try and take care of you which i mean <laughs> got jobs and but it, it did blow my mind quite how expensive it was and it's like oh my god <laughs> save up some money for retirement so i'll like your retirement home already so because it's expensive now i'll be dead before then hopefully or, or have my brain inside a computer don't die <laughs> 
please. Anyway, Mrs. Cox was walking home from the shops, her way taking her through a narrow walled pathway. The garrison is appropriately named. From the street, it looks like a fortress complete with battlements and crenellated walls, and it's impossible to see into the grounds from the outside. Before she could get back to her apartment, Mrs. Cox was attacked from behind, her head slammed repeatedly into a brick wall before she was left for dead. Incredibly, Mrs. Cox survived. Police, upon receiving the report, rushed to the scene, only to find the staff, thinking Mrs. Cox had had a fall, had thoroughly washed and scrubbed the area. Detective Sergeant O'Toole, who strikes me as a fairly blunt man, must have struggled to contain his frustration. Sergeant O'Toole had reason to be hopeful, though, as Mrs. Cox's prognosis looked good, and as soon as she was ready to be interviewed, he was armed with a notebook and his best bedside manner. Unfortunately, Mrs. Cox suffered from chronic dementia and couldn't remember anything about the circumstances of the attack, or even that it had taken place. When O'Toole showed her a mirror presenting her with her incredibly battered reflection and insisting that someone had done this to her, Mrs. Cox's response was to gaze at it and say, that's not me. Stymied, again, the police were back to square one. Always not lost, however, the garrison is on one of the busiest streets in Sydney and a public appeal for witnesses was broadcast. Goddamn, dementia is a hell of a disease. My grandma on the other side, she had like dementia for the last few years of her life and it's horrible, man. Like, you don't want to live that. She didn't want to live that. It's just like waiting to die while you can't remember who people are and you can't take care of yourself and you're just lost in like... It feels like, you know, you have these little thought bubbles and then they just pop. And it's so sad. Hundreds of tips flooded in and several eyewitnesses reported seeing a skateboarding teen riding past the garrison at the time of the attempted murder. Inspector Hagen's team were able to put together an identikit and for several weeks some poor kid was probably hunkering down in his parents' basement wondering why an unkind fate had sent the dogs of a whole city on his trail. Or perhaps he didn't notice. In any case, he never came forward. Now, a kid on a skateboard might seem like an improbable suspect, but we have to bear a couple of things in mind. The fact that these crimes had occurred just after school let out made it seem likely to the police that a student might be involved okay <laughs> there we go that's like me wondering why he was like why would the sexual motive be about schools and it's not it's about the timing <laughs> chris it would have been good if you said that before and made me look like less of an idiot presumably they looked at teachers but there's no mention of this anywhere there was also the fact that forensics couldn't pin down the exact nature of the murder weapon this frustrated them immensely nsw police have a good forensics unit which has dealt with some very high profile crimes and it was unusual that they could couldn't narrow down the weapon. They were getting a bit desperate, and since they found that they couldn't rule out the trucks or the deck of a skateboard as a potential candidate, this seemed to add weight to what the team were calling the juvenile hypothesis. Eventually, Dr. DeFlo's team was able to eliminate the skateboard as a potential weapon, but vital resources were spent on looking for the skateboarder for some time afterwards as he remained a person of interest. I think that's fair. Like, they don't have a lot of leads. I feel like Chris is saying they spent vital resources on this. It's like, yeah, because where else are they going to spend them? This is, this is, isn't this detective work? This is fine. Maybe it is the skateboarding dude. I don't think it is. One, because of how Chris has pitched it. And also because I think it's probably someone in their 20s or 30s. Um, just based on, like, doing lots of casual criminalists about killers. They're rarely children or teenagers. It's adults, men. Um... Yeah. It's also worth noting that skateboarding was definitely a subculture which was often associated with delinquency and criminality in the popular mind at the time, so perhaps this fixation was understandable. While all of this was going on, the killer continued to haunt the streets. Dorothy Benke, a 78-year-old resident of the affluent suburb of Lane Cove, about four miles from Mosman, was heading home from Lane Cove shops laden with groceries on Thursday the 2nd of November, just a few weeks after the attack at the garrison. Along the way, she was approached by a portly man of 60 years of age, with grey hair and a calm and soothing manner. When they arrived at home, Mrs. Benke, apparently one of the world's most risk-tolerant people, invited him in for a cup of tea. This in spite of the frankly hysterical press coverage of the granny killer, which had been going on for months and is one of my most prominent memories of the time. Yeah, but she's expecting to get beaten up in, a, in an alley, not approached by some dude who's like, ooh, can I have some tea, mate? <laughs> Australia. You say what I did there? This man refused the cup of tea and wandered off. A little bit later, 85-year-old Margaret Pard passed the same man in a narrow laneway near her house. The man turned, caved in her skull from behind, removed her underwear and stole her purse, leaving her shoes placed neatly by her body. Well, what was I saying like three minutes ago that it's probably a dude in his 20s or 30s? This dude was in his 60s. What? 
I mean, of course there are people who kill people in their 60s, but it's so often just younger people. Son, never underestimate an old man. The schoolgirl returning home came across the body and ran home to get her mother. Mrs. Bard was still breathing, and the girl and her mother called an ambulance. By this time, some neighbors had come out to help and decided that Mrs. Pard must have suffered a heavy fall. <laughs> By the time the ambulance arrived, Mrs. Pard was pronounced dead, and her neighbors washed down the crime scene. Are you shitting me? For real? Now? It was all over the press. This might seem really strange to us, but the Australian public at the time was very forensically unaware, and cleaning up after someone who'd suffered an injury uh, was seen as the caring thing to do. On top of this was the fact that the press had strongly associated these murders with Mosman alone, and Lane Cove was, oh, it was four miles away, of course, this is a different area, it was another area of Sydney, and this kind of crime was considered unthinkable. It wasn't unthinkable for the police, though, who swiftly connected this murder with the other three. They went through their usual routine, canvassing the area, interviewing witnesses, and recording what little evidence had been left by the well-intentioned citizens who'd cleaned the scene. But they were seriously hampered by the press coverage, who were all eager to introduce the public to the concept of copycat killings. The Australian public at large had very little awareness of the tropes and popular beliefs about serial killers at the time, so the press, in its effort to be an expert authoritative voice, decided that the change in low car must be the work of a copycat. According to Mike Hagan, the sudden introduction of the copycat idea significantly tainted their potential witness pool. Time and again, they would interview potential potential witnesses who were resistant to the idea of all three murders being linked, which made them argumentative and difficult to interview. Holy sh**, members of the public, how about you let the police make those decisions and determinations, rather than, uh, than you doing it? Because you're just a pleb. Why would... <laughs> Just answer the bloody questions! In the meantime, detectives set up an incident room at Lane Cove and proceeded to work through the night and all through the next day. Good police work involves an improbable amount of paperwork, as well as pounding the pavement and talking to people, and the police were determined to ensure the highest level of momentum possible in the crucial 24-hour period just after a murder. Come the next afternoon, which was Friday, Inspector Hagen's team were drooping with fatigue, and he made arrangements to knock them off and hand over to deputy commanders and staff who would keep the incident room running while they got some sleep. Mike Hagen got as far as a few hundred meters from his house and Sergeant O'Toole was in the process of cracking open a can of beer, a tinny in Australian parlance, when the call came through. There was another body. This one was in a retirement village in Belrose called Wesley Gardens. I know this place quite well, as I was sent there by my school as part of their community service program just a few years later. It's a large facility with sprawling grounds, which contains a dementia ward as well as assisted living facilities. It's a tranquil place with sprawling, tree-lined grounds and beautifully manicured gardens, and I'm sure it's outrageously expensive. It does sound nice, like, even my parents, who are like, who, who went to visit my granddad in this expensive nursing home, they're like, they're foodies, like, they're really into their food and going to like all these restaurants and cooking and all of this stuff and like they my dad especially he'll like you know if he has to eat something he'll be like oh this is just horrible i'm like dad it's fine it's just a sandwich from the side of the road or you know a petrol station or whatever we're hungry let's just eat it and he, <laughs> and he was like the food in this place actually not bad <laughs> oh it sounds quite nice <laughs> he's like it's like a hotel with nurses and much more expensive 81-year-old Olive Cleveland was sitting on a park bench in the grounds when she was approached by a middle-aged man with grey hair who engaged her in conversation. Feeling uncomfortable, she moved away, but he followed her to a concrete side path near the main building where he beat her to the grounds before strangling her with her pantyhose. Mrs. Cleveland's body was found by staff members who promptly washed and scrubbed the area before reporting her death. When the police arrived, they were faced once again with a clean crime scene, a complete lack of witnesses, and no viable forensic evidence. At this point, there were about 35 detectives working the case, following up leads, conducting active surveillance of suspects and passive surveillance of churches, shopping centers, and retirement homes, and generally running themselves ragged trying to track down one of the state's first known serial killers. With three dead and one attempted murder, and with the murder rhythm and violence level escalating dramatically, the decision was made to form a larger task force, and the number of sworn officers working the case jumped to 70. These new officers came from a variety of different units, and there was even a specialized detachment of undercover surveillance officers known in parlance of the time as the dogs. By this time, media coverage was utterly frenzied, which is understandable, and there was a real sense of panic, not just in the more affluent parts of North Shore, but all over Sydney. The public and political pressure on the NSW police to close this case was higher than ever. A house call in old man shoes. 
Muriel Falconer was a strong and independent 93-year-old lady who lived alone in a house in a peaceful, leafy Mosman Street set back from the main precinct. I've lived on that street myself, and it really is a lovely community. People say hello as you pass, and neighbors genuinely look out for one another. Mrs. Falconer was determined to be as independent as possible, and despite her partial deafness and failing vision, she was highly successful at this, with a little help from Meals on Wheels and her near neighbors. In the late afternoon, by the way, Mrs. Falconer has a sick surname. Falconer. I love that. In the late afternoon, Friday the 23rd of November 1989, Mrs. Falconer was heading home from the shops. She passed the Buena Vista Hotel, called the Buna by locals allergic to foreign pronunciations. Uh, oh, Buna Vista. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> really? A popular with workers from the nearby zoo. Sitting in the Buna was a middle-aged man with gray hair who, spotting Mrs. Falconer, proceeded to follow her home. When she was in the process of opening her front door, he struck her repeatedly on the head, threw her to the ground, and began removing her pantyhose. Mrs. Falconer came to and began struggling, calling out, so he beat her unconscious once more, finished removing her pantyhose, and then strangled her with them. He stole money from her purse, closed, and locked the front door, and then left. The next morning, Mrs. Falconer's neighbors noticed that her Meals on Wheels lunch was still uncollected on her doorstep. Maggie Hughes, a registered nurse and good friend of Muriel's, decided to use her spare key to go and check on her. When she opened the door, she was confronted with the sight of Mrs. Falconer's prone body, her skull fractured and bloody, a full carton of ice cream on the hallway floor, and her empty purse sitting ransacked on a side table. Mrs. Falconer's shoes had been placed neatly beside her, and Maggie, as a nurse, knew from the smell that her friend had recently died. Maggie Hughes, unlike the generality of the Australian public, knew a crime scene when she saw one, and being aware of the wall-to-wall media coverage, knew instinctively that this must be the work of the so-called granny killer. So, making sure to preserve the crime scene, she confirmed her friend was dead and called the police. When they arrived, they got to work with feverish eagerness, as this was the very first pristine crime that they'd found in this whole series of murders. Maggie was a good witness too, having a retentive memory and a strong eye for detail, a rare and precious commodity in any investigation. Police were able to gather a wealth of forensic evidence in the form of blood samples and distribution patterns, which is how we're able to know the exact sequence of the crime. Most excitingly of all, they also found a footprint in a blood stain on the carpet. This section of carpet was cut out for analysis, but the press had gathered in front of the house, and Inspector Mike Hagen was determined to keep his new evidence secret for fear that the killer might dispose of his shoes if he saw news footage of forensic officers carrying footprint evidence away from the crime scene. I feel like just as a, a pro tip, like if you are committing a murder, um, and you think I didn't leave any evidence behind, just burn your clothes anyway. What have you got to lose? It's just clothes. Like, the risk-reward ratio is very much in favor of burning those clothes. And those shoes. And then burying the ashes or throwing them in the ocean. Something like that. Hagen and his team quickly hatched a plan. There was a busy construction site adjacent to Mrs. Falconer's house, and forensic officers were ostentatiously sent over to take plaster casts of footprints in the mud of the building site. Officers were briefed to tell the waiting press that they had found vital clues in the site next door, and footage was broadcast on the evening news of police taking plaster casts of footprints from the site. This brilliant piece of disinformation was designed to lull the killer into a false sense of security, as he'd be aware that the footprints they were talking about couldn't be his own. The police canvassed the whole Mosman precinct once again, and information came flooding in, swelling the suspect list to 740. Of these, 739 were individually eliminated. The last one was a 22-year-old unemployed man with a history of mental illness and whose relationship with his mother was so bad, police had been called to his house multiple times. If I'm the police right now, I'm thinking, ladies and gentlemen, we've got him. <laughs> Jesus, poor kid. But we know it's not because we know it's a gray-haired man. Unless this 22-year-old has gray hair. Which can happen. I think it's extremely unlikely, but it can happen. From the detective's point of view, this was a perfect match for their criminal profile. They promptly put the dogs on him, running 24-hour covert surveillance, exhausting work which they hoped would catch him in the act. In the meantime, though, a task force detective sergeant called Paul Tuxford had decided to go back to square one, pouring through every single witness statement in a thorough and methodical manner to see if there was anything they'd missed. While doing this, he came across an inconsistency, which led him back to Maggie Hughes, who, upon being re-interviewed, mentioned that she'd seen a portly middle-aged man in a silver suit it was the 80s after all, lurking around the area. This was the early days of computing, and people charmingly described as computer experts were tired asked by Sergeant Tuxford to do a word search of the police database for the keywords gray, head, old, and man. 
old school. Now, this yielded more than half a dozen hits, all involving violent muggings of elderly ladies in Sydney's North Shore. Sergeant Tuxford, now convinced that they'd been hunting the wrong profile of suspect this whole time, spent a sleepless night waiting for the opportunity to present his theory at the next morning briefing. At the same time, Dr. DeFlo and his team established that the print they'd lifted from Mrs. Falconer's carpet was consistent with a type of shoe worn by older men, and also a type often favored by ex-military types. This might sound weird to some, but as an ex-military person myself, I can attest that my shoe choice changed significantly post-service, and a forensic profiler would probably reach the same conclusion about me from my footprints. These two new pieces of evidence led the police to drastically reconsider their investigation thus far. Chris, now I just want to know what what sort of shoes are you buying? What sort of shoes did the military get that you were like, these are so wonderful that now I wear these? What would that be? Like, I was in the cadets and we wore like boots and stuff. And they were, you know, just reasonably uncomfortable boots. What what did the, what does the actual military have? What, Chris, you've got to let me know. Email me. I want, I want to get some new shoes. They must be good. Oh, look at me. I'm shaking in my little space boots. Task Force detectives realized that the juvenile theory, which had been the most prominent, may have fatally skewed their inquiry. The realization that an erroneous frame of reference may have caused them to consistently ask the wrong questions prompted them to conduct a full review of their existing materials, as well as re-canvassing every area and re-interviewing every witness and person of interest, in addition to following up their new leads. First and foremost among these was an assault which the keyboard search had turned up. The victim was one Miss Margaret Todd Hunter of Mosman. About two months before the murder, she had been attacked by a grey-haired man who had punched her in the face and robbed her of $209. At the time, the police had no reason to think this was anything more than an isolated mugging, so they diligently recorded the reports and moved on to other cases. Sergeant Tuxford and team set about tracking Mrs. Todd Hunter down, found that she'd moved to Queensland, and flew up to interview her when they found found to her delight that this grand old lady had a mind like a steel trap and was able to provide a sufficiently detailed description for a high confidence identikit. The police finally had the beginnings of a promising case, an accurate description of their prime suspect, and a renewed sense of hope. The Grey Head Man John Glover was born in 1932 in the north of England. His was a working-class family, and Glover later showed signs of resenting the poverty in which he was brought up. What he resented most, however, was his mother, Frida. When Frida and his father divorced, Glover began to develop a hatred for his mother, blaming her for the departure of his father, whom he idolized. This hatred intensified when his mother went through a series of relationships, including three marriages. He began, by his own account, to think of her as a loose woman, disrespecting herself and his absent father. Now, I don't really know anything about Frida or about the domestic situation in the Glover household, but there are multiple explanations for this kind of behavior on her part, including perhaps a desperate attempt to recreate a whole family according to the norms and expectations of the time. Also, um, there's reasonable explanation for her behavior. She can do whatever she f***ing wants. <laughs> She's an independent individual who can make her big decisions. This isn't the 1930s, it's the 1980s. And I know times have changed even since the 1980s, of course, but come on, she could do whatever she wants. Regardless, Glover basically wrote her off as a libertine and began a typical career for a maladjusted teen, committing a range of minor property crimes. Later, when he was doing his national service, it seems he was caught stealing again and discharged. Now, there's some dispute over this, with some sources reporting that his criminal record being discovered was the reason, but I find this unlikely as his juvenile records would have been sealed. What I think has happened here is a garbling of the available records. In any event, Glover emigrated to Australia in 1956, settling in Melbourne, where he took advantage of the preferential migration programs for white people from English-speaking countries, which were in place at the time. They don't seem to have helped him much, though. He drifted between a succession of low-paying jobs as well as racking up a few convictions for larceny and indecent assault, once on a young woman and another time on an elderly lady. At some point, for obscure reasons, he seems to have changed his name to John Wayne Glover. <laughs> John Wayne? He just added Wayne in there? My old man was a big John Wayne fan. In 1968, it seemed Glover made an attempt to turn his life around. He met and married a nice young lady named Gay Rawls and moved in with her in Sydney, settling first in their own home in Mosman before moving in with Gay's parents, Essie and Jack, who had a large house nearby. At this time in Australia, class differences mattered much more than they do today, and it seems Essie was not happy about her daughter marrying beneath herself. This seems to have made the relationship between Glover and his 
mother-in-law extremely difficult. He seems to have expressed real liking for his father-in-law, Jack, which is an exact mirror of his relationship with his own biological parents. After some initial struggles, Glover eventually landed a steady job as a sales rep for the 4 and 20 Pie Company. 4 and 20 Pies were and still are an iconic brand in Australia and really don't need too much selling, so Glover was, as the saying goes, on a pretty good wicket. On top of this, his marriage seemed initially to be going well despite his problems with his mother-in-law and the union was blessed with two daughters. I can really not, like, it would suck. You don't get along with your mother-in-law and you live in the same house with them. <laughs> You're like, ah, oh, why is life like this? Life is a nightmare. Various accounts describe a strained home life with constant sniping at Glover from Essie and screaming matches between John's wife, Gay, and her mother. Aside from this, though, Glover's lifestyle seemed an enviable one. He'd start work early in the morning, doing the rounds of hospitals and retirement homes to take orders for pies before finishing in the mid to late afternoon, or he'd head to the pub and drink beer and play the pokies, which is Australian slang for slot machines. Like many other Australians, Glover, or we call them fruit machines in the UK. Fun fact. Like many other Australians, Glover seems to have developed an addiction to playing the pokies as well as a habit of hanging around pubs in the late afternoon, making friends with the local barflies, and occasionally standing them drinks. Glover's mother, Frida, moved to Australia in 1976, thus doubling the number of women involved in his life whom he couldn't stand, and while Glover continued to associate with both of them, it was clear his relationship with these two significant women in his life was seriously fraught. In 1989, Frida died of breast cancer, and shortly after this, Glover himself was diagnosed with the same disease, a very strange coincidence, which Glover, in his own mind, put down to the malign influence of his mother. Okay then. Treatment for this cancer made Glover impotent, but in spite of this, he began seeing a 60-year-old woman called Joan Sinclair. There's some confusion about this relationship, with various sources saying either that it was an affair or that it was in a platonic friendship. I'm not sure it matters very much. Suffice it to say, either way, Glover was looking for companionship and comfort outside of his marriage, which was struggling by this time. I don't know, I'd say there's a really big difference between whether you're having an affair or whether it's a platonic friendship. <laughs> Doesn't that make a difference? It feels like that should be a difference. Gay had taken their two daughters to New Zealand, and it seems the marriage wasn't completely repaired even after she returned. Now we're caught up on Glover's life and crimes, let's get back to the police investigation, which had been going on for just over a year, with thousands of leads and close to a thousand suspects eliminated. The NSW government had been offering progressively higher rewards for information leading to the killer's capture, starting at $200,000 and going all the way up to a quarter million by 1990. This was serious money in Australia at the time, probably equivalent in purchasing power to nearly a million dollars today. The cops were still frequently working 20-hour days, and the dogs were still running surveillance on nursing homes and hospitals. The dogs were the undercover guys. On top of this, they were doing all the re-canvassing and re-interviewing which the grey-haired man theory had necessitated. The task force was also fighting a losing battle to stop the press and the public from calling their perp the granny killer, attempting to rebrand him the North Shore murderer, a far less catchy, if also less offensive sobriquet. Chief among their new follow-ups was a report of an indecent insult of an elderly lady in the Caroline Chisholm nursing home in Lane Cove. Armed with their identikit, police followed this lead and found a therapist who had filed a report from, in his own words, an elderly lady who was quite excited someone had touched her buttocks. Okie dokie. Of course, she was using the word excited in the old-fashioned sense, meaning something more like agitated. Oh, okay. Well, that makes a bit more sense. <laughs> Truly wonderful the mind of a child is. The nurse, Sister Taylor, had confronted a grey-haired man in the hallway who had subsequently fled. The police found multiple similar reports, as well as reports of muggings of elderly women and one unfortunate elderly man who had been wearing a hat and an overcoat which made him look like a woman from a distance. All of this seemed to confirm Sergeant Tuxford's prime suspect, the grey-haired man. Then, on January the 11th, an elderly lady at the Greenwich Private Hospital called in a nurse to complain that the doctor had come to her room, told her that she was losing body heat, lifted her gown, and touched her genitals. The nurse knew something was wrong straight away as it was a weekend and there were no, no doctors on site. Also, I don't think doctors... <laughs> oh my lord. The nurse confronted a man who was walking away, but he ignored her, so she called the police to report an indecent assault. A junior detective constable, Pamela Young, was dispatched with her partner to follow up the call. Detective Constable Young did all the required Detective Constable things and used the visitor list and the victim's description to come up with a likely suspect, a meat pie salesman named John Wayne Glover. But by the time she'd done the spade work, 
It was nearly 10 p.m., so she decided to leave it until the next day. When she did track Glover down, he exercised his right to silence and made arrangements to meet the next day with a lawyer present. The next day came and went, and after 6 p.m., Constable Young called Glover's house to find out where he'd got to. John's wife, Gay, answered the phone and unloaded a torrent of abuse on the young detective. She informed her that John Glover had been pushed over the edge by their ridiculous allegations and had attempted suicide by washing down a bunch of sleeping pills with a bottle of that 69 whiskey. Glover had been admitted to Royal North Shore Hospital, where the police duly went to interview him. That guy's gonna wake up having tried to kill himself and be like, oh, and then he's gonna, you know, that classic movie scene at the hospital where it's like you wake up and there's the, uh, the, uh, handcuffs like cuffing you to the bed and he'd be like oh no oh no oh no <laughs> you're f***ed it's all over don't worry you can still kill yourself in prison if you want <laughs> although probably not right because you're going to be on suicide watch for sure you need that Jeffrey Epstein magic. Once there, they found a doctor who handed them a suicide note scrawled on a used piece of 4 and 20 stationery. Uh-oh. Does the suicide note admit to all of his crimes? Uh-oh. They went to interview Glover, but found him still refusing to cooperate. Somehow, Pam Young managed to convince Glover that taking a Polaroid of him would help eliminate him as a suspect, so they snapped a picture and left for Greenwich Hospital, where Sister Taylor, the nurse, identified him as the man she had confronted. And then, because the police are burdened by bureaucracy as much as any other government organization, the Polaroid and suicide note were filed away, and Pam Young went on a two-week training course. When she got back, however, she picked the inquiry right back up, taking a closer look at that suicide note. It was more a collection of fragmentary phrases, barely legible, saying things like sell up and piss off, gay, don't try to understand, Essie started it, and no more grannies. The note also revealed that Glover had become impotent as a side effect of his cancer treatment. Detective Young realized the significance of what she had and took it to the North Shore Murders Task Force. Constable Young recalls being quite nervous about the whole thing. Here she was, a young female detective constable, taking a tip to a squad of the highest flyers and biggest names in homicide investigation in the whole state. Once the task force had seen the note, she sprang into action, immediately setting aside resources to follow up what looked to be a case-breaking lead. Yeah, good for you. Seeing that, tying it together and being like, let's go. That's nice. Detectives were sent to canvas retirement homes and hospitals all across North Shore, showing copies of the Polaroid and asking about any incidents of violence or sexually inappropriate behavior. They interpreted the note as being part explanation for his behavior, instructions to his family to realize their assets and leave, and a vague reference to his crimes. They also set the dogs and I'm abandoning their previous surveillance targets to monitor Glover's movements in search of anything in his pattern of life which might link him more definitively to the murders. Glover seems to have spotted them pretty quickly and began employing counter-surveillance techniques which led the cops to covertly fit a tracker to his car. This is it, mate. Like, they're letting you go just so they can get some more evidence on you. It's at that point, you've got to, like, slip away, right? I don't know if you can escape the cops once they're, like, monitoring you like this. But I don't know, maybe watch those Jason Bourne movies and uh, come up with a strategy because your only chance now, mate, you just got to run. You just got to run and hope for the best because you are screwed. Endgame. From our perspective, it might look like an open and shut case, but from the police's point of view, there wasn't really enough of a solid case. The sexual assault, the profile, even the note didn't add up to much more than circumstantial evidence. Okay, that's fair. Maybe it's not to run. Maybe you just face the music and be like, I don't think you got enough evidence. I'm not admitting to anything. And uh, let's see how this goes. Because, I mean, we get to court. you got to prove, prove it beyond all reasonable doubt, don't you? Which is a very high burden to meet. The cops themselves were completely convinced in a way they hadn't been with any other subject to date. But they knew that they didn't have nearly enough evidence to persuade the Department of Public Prosecutions to take their case to trial. And given his social status, his legal reputation, and their assessment of his character, their biggest fear would be if they'd arrest him and had simply refused to talk. In such a circumstance, with the evidence they had so far, they'd have tipped their hand and ended up absolutely nowhere. Oh, I feel like the hand is already tipped. They know. He knows. Like, who are we pretending? Mike Hagen and the task force detectives knew what they needed was either to catch him red-handed, establish a conclusively incriminating pattern of life, or somehow a confession. They've been following the man for nearly six weeks, however, and apart from his obvious but effective efforts at counter-surveillance, there wasn't a whisper of anything suspicious. Of course not, because he knows he's being watched. In the meantime, John Wayne Glover had convinced his wife that the accusations against him were baseless, so she retained criminal defense attorney Don Wakeling to help her husband get clear of what he described as these scurrilous accusations. Wakeling, a man who looks exactly like the sort of person who played a defense attorney in a gritty Australian film noir, duly took the job, believing 
believing at the time that Glover was innocent. The police, meanwhile, were furiously active, tying up loose ends in their own investigation and coordinating and supplementing the 24-hour surveillance being maintained on Glover. Near the end of their list of follow-up investigations was a visit to the James Milson Retirement Village in Milson's Point, a suburb right at the northern end of the Sydney Harbour Bridge and only minutes away from Mosman. Incidentally, it's also very near my high school. Well, there you go. Thanks, Chris. Anyway, Detective Constable Kim McKay was detailed to go to the Milson retirement home, where she sewed the receptionist the Polaroid and went through the routine questions. Their very wide canvas of aged care facilities and hospitals had turned up a few incidences of indecent assault already, so hopes were high despite the grinding nature of the job. When the receptionist looked at the picture and asked if they were looking for John Wayne Glover, who worked for 4 and 20 Pies, McKay thought she'd hit the jackpot, a positive ID from a witness, and asked how the receptionist knew him. I'm his wife, the receptionist replied. Oh my god, is that a twist? This absolutely floored the detective, and she desperately tried to appeal to Gay Glover not to reveal her visit. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Talk about the. Can you imagine just the bottom dropping out of that detective? You'd just be like, I think I'd be silent for like a good few seconds while I process the odds of this and how f***ed up I have just f***ed up. <laughs> This raises a small point. It seems the task force had a completed a human network map where known associates are identified and basic information about them is gathered, or if they had, this data hadn't been passed on to the whole task force. This isn't a cardinal sin necessarily, though it would be in an organized crime case, but it does show that the investigation wasn't by any means perfect. Oh, I see why. Yeah, that would be super important in an organized crime because, you know, they're all like secretive and interconnected and stuff. But in a normal one, it's just like, okay, maybe it's someone's family members who would like tip them off like which is a very small group but still i see why it makes sense to do this by the standards of australia in the 80s it was stellar and even by today's standards it was excellent work but crime of this kind was a significant teaching moment for the nsw police force and even though the task force detectives rose to the challenge admirably uh, there were still some rough spots here and there stumbling over your prime suspect's wife during a canvas being one of those yeah no shit. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, Gay Glover went straight to her husband to tell him about Detective McKay's visit, as she not only had no reason to believe her husband was the infamous granny killer, it seemed likely she had every reason not to want to believe it either. Glover's home life seems to have been almost completely unremarkable. Sure, he was drunk most of the time and had a slight gambling problem, if you can call throwing money down the bottomless pit of the pokies gambling, but this was 1990 and the past was the worst. By 1990 standards, none of Glover's known foibles precluded him from being a pillar of the community. Glover himself, however, knew what he was and his wife's news sent him into a tailspin john glover wasn't exactly mentally well at this point besides being a compulsive sexually motivated murderer he had also recently attempted suicide and had a persecution complex correctly believing himself to be under surveillance to boot so yeah it's like uh what's that saying um uh, that you're not crazy if they really are watching you so a few days after his wife had confirmed his worst suspicions that the cops were hot on his trail and likely to catch him glover called his work and excused himself for the day citing illegal appointments he left his house at the usual time in the morning tried unsuccessfully to shake off the dogs before driving to a liquor store and purchasing a bottle of that 69 whiskey this done he drove to a house in beauty point a suburb which is essentially a part of mosman where he parked got out of his car took off his tie and carefully combed his hair once he was spruced up to his own satisfaction police watched him walk into a house across the road and knock on the door the door opened and glover was warmly welcomed inside whose house is this the dogs settled down to wait hours passed then hours more and sergeant o'toole who was on the comm back at headquarters began to get concerned a reverse directory search on the address revealed that the house belonged to 60 year old joan sinclair police I feel like you should be going in there. Couldn't he be murdering Joan right now? A woman with whom Glover had been having some kind of close relationship for some time. This would seem to explain the long visit, but there was a sense of disquiet among the task force detectives, and O'Toole took a team over to sit near the surveillance post and monitor the situation in person. The day wore on until school children began straggling at home in the late afternoon. The granny killers preferred hunting time. One pair of homeward-bound school kids knocked at Joan Sinclair's front door and received no answer. The surveillance team also noted that two dogs, which seemed to either be in or behind the house, had begun barking incessantly. And their prime suspect in the murders of numerous elderly ladies had been alone in the house with a 60-year-old lady for nearly eight hours. All of this put together finally made the police anxious enough to take action. Yeah, it's like, you go in there and he's just having a drink with his mate. 
or is a fair woman or whatever then that's going to blow your chances of finding him doing something more serious wide open but on the other hand he could be murdering joan couldn't he not wanting to compromise the identity of the surveillance team sergeant o'toole called in a nearby uniform patrol to follow up a fictional noise complaint oh come on he's not going to believe that for a second the officers reported no movement in the house which was seriously disquieting at this point the detectives decided to go in detective sergeant o'toole and three of his colleagues from the task force breached the door and performed a room to room clearance in one room they found the body of joan sinclair sprawled on the ground near to a bloodied hammer Yep, so it turns out he was killing Joan. In the bathroom, they found John Wayne Glover. He was in the bathtub, lying unconscious, with his mouth and nose just above the waterline, blood and vomit liberally mixed with the bathwater. And the detritus of another attempt at self-destruction scattered around him. There was an empty bottle of Vat 69 whiskey, a scattering of sleeping pills, and a broken whiskey glass that he'd used to slash his left wrist. The detectives called in an ambulance, as well as reporting what they'd found to Mike Hagen, and despite their deep disgust of the man, still made feverish efforts to keep Glover alive until the ambulance arrived. The sheer amount of whiskey Glover had consumed appears to have saved his life, as he'd drunk so much that he wasn't able to keep the sleeping pills down, and the slash on his wrist was too ineptly executed to result in death. The ambulance rushed Glover to North Shore Hospital, at which point the task force began the work of processing the new crime scene. In the meantime, I imagine the task force was busy explaining to various levels of command how come they'd let a murder suspect beat an innocent woman to death literally under their noses. Well, because they wanted to... I know, it was just, it was a tough call. It wasn't incompetence. It was just a really tough call. Because they're like, what if he's not killing her? And then we arrest him and we tip our hands and he never kills anyone again or never does anything dodgy again and lives a perfectly clean life and we don't get to get him to prison. And it's probably better they save Joan's life, isn't it? Actually, thinking about it. That sucks. Okay, there's definitely going to be some investigation there. I'm not sure they can be blamed for this, and officially they weren't, but it did look quite bad. Now, Common Sense and all the other equipment of the armchair critics seemed to make it pretty obvious that they should have rushed into the house and arrested him as soon as they became uneasy, but there are strong arguments against this. Firstly, they'd been watching Glover for over a month and a half without any sign that he was stalking a new target or contemplating violence. On top of this, there was nothing at all to suggest that if he was their killer, that he was anything other than a stranger killer. There just wasn't any reason to believe Glover would break his pattern of murder and murder someone known to him. And lastly, their main priority was to build and preserve their practically non-existent case. As soon as they started kicking down doors and slapping on cuffs, the fear was that Glover would clam up, and they didn't have anywhere near enough for a prosecution, much less a conviction. Yeah, of course, and I, I know I said, I, I agree with Chris. I agree with what the police did. To be fair, I'm not being an armchair critic on this one. It's, uh, it was a super tough decision. And of course, I said it was better to keep Joan alive than not get their conviction of this dude. But the reality is then he'd be out on the street still murdering people. So, yeah. To many, including media and commentators at the time, this didn't seem like a strong set of arguments. And there are quite a few folks to this day who think that the death of Joan Sinclair was the single greatest bungle made by the NSW police to date. Honestly, if that's their biggest bungle, then they've got an exemplary record. Because yeah it's not that big of a bungle in my opinion there was a rational reason it wasn't like they were sit sitting there eating donuts and drinking coffee while then not noticing that he was inside murdering someone they had to make a call and they made a judgment call and they screwed up guy died end of story however you feel about it there was reason but for many people who know their way around a murder investigation as i'm sure many of our cash crim audience do is pretty persuasive now you may or may not be convinced by this and the public was scathing about this last murder but both the coroner and the state government found the police to be blameless here and from the reading of the parliamentary questions tabled in the new south wales house of commons i myself find it difficult to hold this one against them sergeant o'toole and inspector hagen have said repeatedly that the death of joan sinclair has weighed heavily on them as well it might but they themselves are convinced that they didn't do anything wrong. Glover was stabilized quite quickly, and one of the task force was sent to visit the hospital room and place him under arrest. Glover's first words to the police were to wonder how all of this would affect his family. They said, well, not well, mate. Not well. The results of you murdering people is not going to have a good effect on your family. It's going to look bad, and it's going to make their lives worse. Maybe you should have thought about that before murdering people. The detective told him he should focus on his own situation, at which point Glover basically confessed to the murder of Joan Sinclair. O'Toole and another detective were called in, and they conducted an interview in the presence of Glover's attorney, at first focused on the Sinclair murder, and then moving on to the rest. 
Glover asked if the detectives had noticed how similar all of his victims were to his mother-in-law, Essie. His manner was detached, and he seemed to want to compare notes on what the police had determined about his crimes. He described in a matter-of-fact way how he'd stalked his victims at random, using the fact that his pie salesman job took him all over the North Shore, how he would carry gardening gloves, a hammer, and towel in his trunk. He'd conceal the hammer in his waistband and attack his targeted women from behind. He talked about his victims, including Lady Ashton, commenting that she'd seemed close to overpowering him. If only she'd succeeded, this would be a much happier story. He claimed there was no sexual motive, that the sexually humiliating poses of the body were a deliberate red herring to throw the police off the scent. Neither the police nor the forensic psych believed this, and neither do I. Yeah, and neither do I, Chris. This, this, this guy's just a weirdo. And that's part of his being weird. Dr. Deflo, the forensic pathologist, described his chagrin at finding out that the murder weapon, the nature of which had been one of the most enduring mysteries of the case, had turned out to be simply a hammer. The fact is that Glover's wrapping of the hammer in a piece of toweling had disguised the signature marks that the hammer leaves in bone. This, combined with the eradication of splatter patterns by kindly, well-meaning people who had cleaned up almost all of the crime scenes, had made it impossible to positively identify what was normally one of the easiest murder weapons to spot. Glover talked about how go to local pubs, especially the Mossman RSL and the Buena Vista, in order to spend the money that he stole from his victims on the slot machines. He'd also buy drinks for elderly female acquaintances that he knew at these venues, his sick mind finding the irony of this darkly amusing. He talked about how he'd washed the hammer with hydrochloric acid after each killing and described his crimes in the words of one of the detectives as if he was talking about making a cup of tea. This interview was recorded in a police notebook, each page of which Glover willingly initialed. Mate, your attorney was there, your lawyer was sitting there. <laughs> He's just like, okay, carry on, carry on. Your lawyer should be like, shut your f***ing mouth. <laughs> what are you doing? When he came to trial, however, he pled not guilty by reason of temporary insanity, basically a diminished responsibility defense. He tried, somewhat clumsily, to present a kind of split personality account of his offending, claiming that a persona he called Evil John would take control of his actions from time to time before Good John would come back as he went about the rest of his life. That sounds like bull****. The prosecutor, Queen's counsel, Wendy Robinson, recalled that the general assumption among the public at the time was that someone who went around hitting elderly ladies with a hammer must necessarily necessarily be insane. This is, of course, untrue. It's perfectly possible to be evil enough to commit these acts without being sufficiently insane to meet the legal standard. The worry was, though, that with public opinion being that he must be crazy, it would be difficult to persuade a jury that he wasn't. Glover had also hired a couple of psychologists as expert witnesses who insisted that his relationship with his mother and mother-in-law were prime factors in disturbing the balance of his mind. His experts contended that he harbored a deep desire to kill his mother, and that since her death, his mother-in-law, Essie, had become a proxy for this desire. Once Essie died, went the theory, Glover had moved the focus of his rage to random women who resembled her. Fine, okay, great, the psychologists are saying this in your defense, but that doesn't make you crazy, that makes you a murderer. The police forensic psychologist Dr. Rod Milton didn't disagree with any of this. What he did disagree with, however, was the contention that any of this meant that Glover wasn't responsible for his actions. Thank you, Dr. Milton. Exactly. <laughs> he pointed out the meticulous nature of the crimes, in particular the preparation and cleanup phases. He asked Glover exactly when Good John took over. Was it, for instance, before or after he cleaned the blood off the hammer? Did Bad John pack murder equipment in the car before he went to work and then leave him alone for the rest of the day? Through question like this, Dr. Milton was able to show clear premeditation, which scuppers an insanity plea in Australian law. It did in practice, too, with the jury coming back after barely two hours and finding Glover guilty on all counts. Justice James Woods, who also conducted some of the country's most famous royal commissions, including the one into the police corruption that we discussed in the Operation Florida video, sentenced Glover to be imprisoned for the term of his natural life, a very rare sentence in Australia, and that's what he deserves. Besides, isn't he quite old by this point? I can't remember how old he was, but if he gets like 20 years, he's going he's gonna to be dead. Or like 25, 30. Just the whole life, brilliant. As he deserves. In a long and detailed opinion, Justice Woods explained that a man who committed crimes of this nature could never expect to be rehabilitated or to cease to represent a danger to the public. Glover attempted to appeal the sentence many times, but he ultimately died in prison in 2005, dying where he belonged. Yes. How many murders 
When we see the random sexual assaults and muggings Glover committed prior to the killing of Mrs. Mitchell Hill, Glover's first known victim, there seems to be a neat pattern of ex escalation which fits the arc of most serial murderers. There are several serious problems with this, though not least of which is that the murders began when he was 58. The majority of experts in this field, as well as many of the investigating officers, believe that he must have started killing well before this. It's highly unusual for a serial murder to begin their career, so to speak, in their late 50s, and the degree of violence used strongly suggests that it probably escalated to that point over time. But with no recorded murders before Mrs. Mitchell Hill, what was he escalating from? Yeah, I, I mean, I made the mistake earlier of thinking it must be a dude in his 20s or 30s because that's kind of generally who does the... Who begins murdering on casual criminalist episodes and i assume in the murdery wo world as a whole it's highly unusual for someone to go straight from groping and punching people in the face to caving in the heads of random innocent victims with a hammer it's not impossible of course it's just highly unusual added to this is a host of disturbing facts after his mother freda came to australia she eventually ended up in a facility on the central coast a stretch of beaches north of sydney where retirees commuters driven out of the city by sydney's dystopian housing market and long-standing locals live in breathtakingly beautiful surroundings glover would frequently travel to Umina, an area of the central coast to visit his half-sister and mother. While there, he sexually assaulted residents at his mother's care facility, but that's not all. Two women, one 73 and the other 80, were sexually assaulted and killed with a hammer five years before his Mosman spree and on dates corresponding with his visits. And during the time he lived in Melbourne as a young immigrant, there were four other murders, all very similar, which many in the task force suspect to be Glover's handiwork. The treatment of the bodies and M.O. are nearly identical, as nearly identical as the six known murders are to each other, and police and criminological experts are convinced with, to quote, a very high level of confidence that Glover committed these killings. Jesus, so he was just on the loose for years. Even the first killing could have been avoided. I feel like two people being murdered with a hammer in a care home? And that went nowhere? And no, I guess no one was caught because obviously the guy who probably did it wasn't caught and they were unsolved? That's mad. And I know it's not always possible. It's not, of course not possible to solve every crime. At least well, back in the beginning, like when he was just murdering, when he just murdered the one person at the beginning, there was just not enough evidence. They were at a loss. Glover was already serving his life sentence when the investigators started making connections to these other crimes, but Glover himself remained tight-lipped. His line was that should the police bring him strong enough evidence that he would confess to other crimes. This sounds weird because it is weird. Glover had nothing to lose, there being no death penalty in Australia, and there was no possibility of parole for him to endanger. The best he could hope for was to contract some debilitating disease and get a compassionate release so that he could die outside. So, why play this cat and mouse game with the cops? I hate the compassionate release. For violent murderers? For serial killers? For the f***ing Lockerbie bomber? You got f***ing compassionate release because he had cancer? And they, they went back to, like, Libya and lived, like, another three years or whatever? F*** that man. And f*** compassionate release. I think it's insane. If you've been sentenced to whole life in prison with no parole, die in prison where you f***ing belong. I think it's outrageous. Well, basically, because he was a narcissistic psychopath, Sergeant Genis O'Toole was Glover's most frequent and, towards the end, only visitor, and he believes he got to know the man quite well. He said Glover's chief pleasure in life was to play mind games with him, dangling hints and suggestions and then clamming up and going coy whenever Dennis would push. I don't want to give you the idea that Glover was some kind of Hannibal Lecter type cunningly manipulating his interrogators with elegance and erudition. It was more like an elephant trying to dance a ballet or a toddler trying to wheedle an ice lolly out of an indulgent aunt. But given that all he had to do was avoid saying anything meaningful, it didn't really matter how good or bad he was at mind games. Short of accidentally confessing, there really wasn't any impediment to him continuing to string the police along indefinitely. Yeah, prison's got to be pretty boring, right? <laughs> it's just like he's probably like just playing games because he's got nothing else to do and literally nothing to lose. It seems Glover enjoyed the feeling of power and importance it gave to him to have Sergeant O'Toole hanging on his every word when he came to visit. It also seems that these visits were Glover's chief, if not only, reason to keep going. One day, when Sergeant O'Toole informed Glover that his visits would end soon, he was about to retire from the police force, Glover tried to give him a sketch that he'd drawn, and although the detective initially refused, Glover insisted. The sketch was of a park in a place called Medlow Bath, a suburb in the Blue Mountains about two hours west of Sydney. Glover pointed out a pair of pine trees in the picture. In the middle of one of the trees was the number nine. Nobody really knows what this means. Was he confessing to the total number of his murders, indicating how many unsolved murders he committed, suggesting he killed another nine in the Blue Mountains? 
or was this just another silly mind game? Nobody was ever able to ask him. Shortly after this last visit, on 10th of September 2005, John Wayne Glover hanged himself in his cell. He wasn't a well man, presumably. The end of his final contact with the outside world was a factor in his giving up on life. I, did the police not go dig up below those pine trees to see if there were nine bodies buried there? They'd be like, just go dig that up. Just go check it out. Look, we've covered a lot of people on this channel who I understand a little bit, or with whom I sympathize to some extent as their offending was connected to unbelievably wretched lives, but that's not the case here. For all I can make out, John Wayne Glover was autonomous in his evil, for all his excuses about being bullied by elderly women, and it's difficult to see anyone regretting his demise. If there's anything we got from this story, it's actually the sterling work of the NSW Police Force. This is an organization I've not rated very highly in the past, but learning about the way they conducted this investigation, Dealing with what was for them a brand new phenomenon or repeatedly rising to the occasion has been a revelation. I think my favorite part of this tale is the way justice was finally served, and I hope it's yours too. It always is. Like, I'm not one of these true crime podcast people who revel in the details of someone having their face cut off. I'm someone who revels in the details of this guy hanging himself in prison where he f-ing belongs. Because f this guy. Dismembered appendices. Number one, we should spare a thought for Glover's wife and two daughters. During the period of his final killing spree, they were all living together, and it's very clear they had absolutely no idea what their husband and father was up to. While his behavior doesn't seem to suggest the perfect family man, they were all still devastated at finding out about the murders and the sexual assaults. They were particularly disturbed by the fact that when they were all watching the news together as a family, Glover would avidly watch coverage of his own murders and laugh and joke about how he, the murderer, was too smart for the police. Nah, and now you're in prison. Well, now you're dead, but you were in prison and they got you, f- face. I've only touched lightly on them as uh, they still get pestered by the media and randos from time to time, and my hope is that they can move past this if we just leave them alone. Always, always. I got a script from, it wasn't Chris, but from someone the other day, and it was naming the family members. And I'm just like, nope, cut all of that out because I'm sure those people, they're related to a murderer. That doesn't make them anything at all other than deserving to be left alone. Number two, beyond criminology specialists, these killings do seem to have generated strong international interest. Interest in Australia has never really faded either. In fact, one of our major free-to-air channels has finally sniffed out increasing interest in true crime and brought back one of its crime investigation shows, and its grand premiere was an episode about John Wayne Glover. Number three, I was just starting high school when Glover was making his run, and I remember being cautioned over the breakfast table to beware of the granny killer just in case he started to broaden his tastes. I thought this ridiculous both then and now, but it's a measure of just how unaccustomed Sydney siders were to serial killers. Gang violence, rape, and mass brawls, we've taken our stride, but John Wayne Glover really creeped us all out. Number four. When I last checked, Detective Inspector Mike Hagen had retired as superintendent and, despite having lost most of the hair on his head, is still doing media appearances and the occasional lecture, justly proud of his part in bringing John Wayne Glover to justice. Indeed. And an episode of The Casual Criminalist. If you're listening to this, please consider leaving a review of this show wherever you get your podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, a like and subscribe would be fantastic. And I'll see you next time.